Not the greatest night's sleep that I've ever had. Until I do this. Totally worth it. It's a tank operator's bag, so I'm told. Hence the arms. And you can get your legs out of it and walk around without taking it off. And this is three days ration. So for any smart aleck who was thinking, why would you pull weight out of a lotus when you can just stop eating all the pies? I have. And let me ask you this. If you don't start overcoming the hurdles between you and working on your car, when are you ever gonna be able to drive it? Now, people have been asking about the dust in the unit. These are the marks left by my knees after a couple of hours only in the unit in a freshly washed pair of jeans. The only way to get round it is to work professionally. I brought some toys with me this time. My engine hoist that I bought in 2008 thinking I would have my own workshop by now. That's why it's still wrapped in plastic and it came with an engine stand so both are set up and ready to go and we turn our attention to the car and I was gonna start at the back so the first thing was the exhaust now it's held to the end of the transaxle with these brackets and there's weight to come out of these for sure but while this is coming off let me tell you the bones of my plan I'm thinking I can make this silencer repackable if I cut a hole in it weld in a frame that will take a new version of this mild steel bracket that's already holding it to the car that will also act as the removable cover to repack the silencer and hopefully shave off quite a bit of weight. It would certainly mean we could lose these straps. So the rest of the exhaust is the flexible joint, the mid box and the collector that run up to the cast iron manifold. Everything so far is coming off very easily. Now, in the chassis are two brace bars, one on either side, they're removable. Mainly, I think, so that servicing the engine and getting it in and out are possible. On the near side, which is the manifold side, there's a butterfly nut, which has to have been put on afterwards, I don't think it's standard, because the manifolds on these cars, being cast iron while the block is aluminium, they heat it and cool at different rates, and I think would often work themselves loose. The other end of the bar is held on by two fairly robust bolts with tab locking washers but somebody's put this one back on the wrong way around or with extra washers which just renders it useless anyway all of this stuff was very easy nothing is seized so far and if you look at this upper rear cross member it looks rusty it's the rustiest component on the whole chassis but it's not actually very bad at all and you can see a lot of the paint is still there and flaking off So with those two brace bars out, I started at the back of the car to move forward and this is the speedo drive. The cross gate linkage for the gearbox and then the main linkage. So with those off down to the calipers and I pulled the calipers off their cradles and slipped out the pads. Over to the other side. The line seems to be original, it was kind of seized up, so I had to spin the caliper itself to free it out. The line on the opposite side has been replaced with a braided one, and it came off no problem. So onto the drive shafts, four bolts here, fairly standard stuff, and they dropped out. And with that dropped out, you can see straight away the droop in the wheel, and it's towing out slightly now, as if you needed proof that the drive shaft was an upper link. Now the near side one didn't pose any more of a problem, but you notice there is a stud missing out of the brake rotor here. Probably wouldn't have been a big deal, it may have made some kind of a vibration. There's one thing I hate finding is where somebody's just not bothered to put something back. 
This is the clutch line, the red pipe. And here's the answer to a little mystery because when I got the car, the clutch pedal was seized solid, it wouldn't move. Turns out this pipe's gotten a whack and is essentially pinched off. Anyway, we keep stripping. Moving forwards, onto this crossgate linkage. It comes through a flange on the side of the bell housing. And it's threaded for adjustment down its length here. So I just released it there and pulled it back through. And then we find the oil cooler. Now I heated and heated these unions, fearing that I was going to start a fire or explosion, but they just wouldn't move. And I was starting to bend the actual body of the cooler. So I looked elsewhere and up at the oil filter, I've released both lines. And off that came, being very careful not to spill oil everywhere. Continuing our journey forward, here's some of the coolant pipes coming up out of the chassis to meet the engine. Now we've got a second pipe here, it's a vacuum for the brake servo I assume. It's a smaller diameter than it comes out up at the front of the car but I can't think that it would be anything else, it is running into the manifold. And then just looking down from that there is more coolant pipes, a return I presume or the feed, I'm not sure which is which, running back into the chassis. Down near the bottom of this one, there's this inexplicable piece of rubber. When I released it, I found a hole underneath and I believe this is where what's called an otter switch goes. It's the thermostatic switch, I presume, for the fans. But it's not here, it's been blanked. We'll research that and come back to it later. Nothing untoward with the rest of this. Simple Jubilee clips, all in reasonable nick, certainly nothing seized up. And this pipe here, well, the metal union in this, we've got to be able to delete this. I mean, even if we have to get some bespoke pipes made, let's just, you know, this is a weight saver too. Now, I'd missed a few things coming forward. At the back of the engine, I'd missed another coolant pipe coming out of the head. And down below, the gear linkage is actually mounted on the engine a little further forward as well, which I hadn't noticed. There's a kind of a joint here you can see the two sections of bar, one running aft, one running fore, bolted together on this arm. And the last thing I could see was this earth strap running from the sump area over to the chassis. No big deal. So after all that, it was time to start cleaning up and getting ready to hoist the engine. and then I ran into a little snag. The car is now sitting too low to let the hoist come underneath it, but no problem. There's very little weight here and I didn't mind jacking it up underneath. Now I have the hoist set at its maximum reach and at that it's rated for a quarter ton, 250 kilos, imperial ton. This is, I assume, certainly bought it in an imperial market. But I think this engine weighs in the region of 125 kilos and the box can't be more than you know, maybe the box is 40 or 50 kilos. So we're under 200 kilos here, I would guess. I haven't drained any of the fluids, by the way. And I borrowed some chains. The bigger chain was mine, actually. And I'm told that it was used to tether a bull maybe 50 or 60 years ago. But it'll do fine as a stay more than anything else towards the rear of this whole engine and drivetrain because I'm going to use the newer chains, the smaller chains up front. And it took a little bit of figuring out to get this set up in a way that was going to be safe and kind to the engine because I certainly don't want to do any damage doing this. So what I want to do is take the weight of the engine and box, not lift it any, but just take the weight so that I can release the engine mounts. At the front of the engine, I want a routing for these chains, let's say sympathetic to the mechanics of the engine. And just where I have them here, I wasn't happy with because they were touching a few things like the alternator and one of the carbs. Here's the offside engine mount and these two nuts sticking out here, this has been repaired. I think a bolt has been driven down through the steel of the mount and into the rubber to hold it all together. Anyway, because of those clearance issues, I thought let's lighten the load slightly and give ourselves a better routing for the chains by dropping the alternator off and I was able to sit the chain in a more engine friendly position. Now we can go with the gearbox hangers and pull those out. And 
then it dawned on me the bottom suspension links are tied in to this gearbox as well there's a cross member and we'll call it the spooner cross member because a man called colin spooner i believe engineered this thing but there's a fairly well known story one of the first prototype esprits was sent to pick up chapman from the airport he was returning i think from the argentinian grand prix who had told spooner no we're not having this bar we want to save weight and the bottom links are going to attach straight to the uprights that hold the brake calipers so this is spree anyway was sent to the airport the car made it down there picked him up he was very happy seemingly jumped in the car and took off and wasn't very far down the road when the suspension collapsed at these points and so the spooner strut was reinstated which is a kind of cool story and it goes to show how closely engineered these cars are. I mean, way more closely engineered than probably most other things, certainly production cars. It wasn't a Ford Escort or even an MG, which is how it seems a lot of people wanted to treat it. They were extremely expensive. The Esprit was the price of a house. It wasn't quite Ferrari territory, but it was still beyond the means of most people. And then you've got high strung engineering like this where you know as was chapman's want components on the car were double jobbing sometimes triple jobbing as was the case with the race cars so i feel that they've never quite gotten a fair shake because how can you apply that mentality to a car with this engineering anyway it took a little bit of just quiet finessing to get the engine and box clear of the chassis a little bit of footwork here and it was catching still even though it was pretty much free on the brake rotors and everywhere else but i couldn't figure out why it was still catching just here and then it dawned on me the little tail for the speedo drive which i hope hasn't been damaged but hey all of these little things will be overcome and with that i ran out of space so we're on to phone footage just to get us at least to a point where we have the engine and box on the deck because this took well the best part of three days to accomplish all this and yeah largely it was down to the camera work and producing the footage but like i said i'm taking my time now because well it's fun and it's more productive that way i find so here's our little rolling chassis it is not going to take much to get this thing bare at this point and like I said, that upper cross member at the very back of the car is worst off of all, but I think it's perfectly savable. Here's that engine mount. It's since swung down. It's not right at all. There are modifications that can be done to these mounts and we will look into those. But for now, I'll leave you with my view from the tent of an evening at Delta Autos. And you remember when you were a kid and you got a new toy and you went to sleep with it just beside your bed so it was the first thing you saw in the morning. Well it turns out you're never too old. Delta Auto Body is on the M50, that's Dublin's orbital motorway and the busiest road in the country which means I either leave at 6am or 10am to beat the traffic or I stay there. And it makes sense on so many other levels because with a box full of food, I'm eating healthy and I'm spending very little. I'm not paying toll money and fuel money. And there's some more news because Tina is gone. Just after the work finished, I realized that Rob, his attitude towards Tina in the sense that he wanted her to be with somebody who would keep her in great fettle or getting better all the time hadn't changed. And so when I realized that I made a few very very choice phone calls a couple of pointed messages and within 24 hours tina was sold and to a great guy who only lives up the road michael who came cycled his bike down put it in the boot and off he went a very happy boy and since then he has refurbished the wheels and gotten to the bottom of those brake parts that i couldn't source for the rear brakes and sorted all of that out and on top of that, some very recent news. Just the other night, somebody made an attempt at stealing Tina, but luckily Michael had taken precautions to make sure that she wasn't startable or drivable. They broke the steering lock, but no other damage, which is good news. Anyway, 
it means that I'm carless again and I'm being dropped to the unit and being picked up after three days, which is great. It means that there isn't a whole lot of driving being done, there isn't a whole lot of money being spent. And on top of that, you know, it's saving me time. And I've realized that I am now tackling all of those things that we all run into, the money thing, the time thing, and the space thing. And you might say, well, you've got a YouTube channel and it means that you've been sponsored a, a workspace. Yeah, but I've used what I have. I don't have a job, I don't have a 95 or a wage, which is a big advantage to anyone who does have that, I've realized. And if you're curious, you can go onto Patreon and see my total income. There is this perception that creators online rake it in. I will put a link to Patreon in the description. I'll also put a link to the merch. There is merch, and if you like it, please do grab something. The content is getting better because I'm eking out that extra time. I have more headspace. I'm able to be more creative with the content and hone it down. And now I can start bringing back in the extra stuff, the interviews and the shout outs and all that kind of thing. I am going to bring the interviews in very much condensed form in the future and the patrons will get the full versions of interviews and extra content because that's only fair. Each patron is somebody who is financially keeping soup going and they deserve something in return. That's it, one last thing. The welder campaign, we are over $900 to the $1,000 target. The only thing is that that money is Canadian dollars and operating in euro after the exchange rate and the fees it's a very different figure and what I'd love to do is get a TIG plant or a plant that can do MIG and TIG so we can figure out what TIG's all about it's been a dream of mine not least because I work on Land Rovers or I own Land Rovers they're alloy bodied and there's a massive question mark over whether that particular alloy is easily weldable or not which I'd love to get to the bottom of so there will be a link to that in the bottom. I'm going to, at the risk of seeming greedy, let that run a bit longer, see if we can build up a head of steam there, and I will put whatever I can scrape together towards it as well, and try and get a MIG stroke TIG plant that we can start playing with. That's it. After all that, let's see if I can remember my new patrons. Alan Perry, Alex Carras, Brendan Morales, Chris Oak, Dave McBlain, Fred Pinzuk, Lutz Panku, Tom Miles and Thomas Burke. Gents, thank you so much for coming on board. There has been a great spike in subscribers since the last episode and I'm hoping that I can keep that going, keep the episodes getting better and better. And until I bring you another one, do get stuck in and good luck. Holy shit, that was the longest.